I think we're not allowed to take this off, right? No, we're not. We're not. Yeah. So, uh, close to the microphone. Yes. And, yeah, I know. Okay. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to this event. Um, I, am, I am going to introduce our special guest today. Um, he is uh, Umut Oskirimle. Uh, he is a professor at Blanquerna Universitat de Ramon Yul. He is also a senior research associate at the Barcelona Center for International Affairs, CIDOP. And he is as well um, a researcher and professor at eBay, um, not far from here. Um, Umut is um, based here in Barcelona. He was a professor at the Center for Middle Eastern Studies, Lund University. He is the author of several books. Some of them are Theories of Nationalism, a critical introduction that's been translated into several languages. Some of them are in, of the region of our study, uh, like Arabic, Turkish, and Persian. Uh, he's also written Contemporary Debates on Nationalism, a Critical Engagement, Tormented by History, into, uh, it, it's, and History, Nationalism in Greece and Turkey. And more recently, he's written Theories of Nationalism, a Critical Introduction, and he's going to uh, talk about nationalism and, um, well, basically uh, centered around Turkey and President Erdogan. And uh, without, without much further ado, I'm going to um, let him speak. Uh, Umut, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, so, the... Thank you very much for uh, to EMET for inviting me and for Anna uh, uh, for for taking over uh, the moderator position at the last minute. Edu cannot make it. Uh, I'm happy to be here, uh, and it's um, because well, as, as I will just mention in a minute, uh, uh, I have been in touch with EMET quite regularly in the last couple of months because of a uh, new summer school that we will be organizing and uh, and it's it's interesting to be thinking about now in terms of a different region I mean I did work on Turkey the Kurdish question um, the Middle East uh, to a certain extent even though I'm not a Middle East expert as such and this is this is the first time that I'll be talking about Turkey for a long time actually you know it's been quite a while uh, and so it was it was uh, quite um, intriguing in many ways to revisit all the all the issues that I was teaching about but did not you know uh, engage with in a critical way so uh, but first uh, with uh, your permission I would like to start with a small promotion because this is the first um, uh, official announcement of our new summer school by Barcelona summer school of the Mediterranean and the Middle East that we've been working on for the last year, mm. and, and actually it brings together... You have to do it in Oh, yes, way. here too, right. Yes. Um, uh, this was a project that we've been... Actually, the reason why you have here uh, Fred Holiday, who was my supervisor, my mentor, even like I would like to call and see him as my second father, that's... He was my connection to Barcelona. I was coming here for since 2005 I think you know it's been quite a time and I've been living here since 2018 Fred had this idea of a summer school on the Mediterranean in 2008-9 uh, but unfortunately we lost him quite early at the age of 63 in 2010 and the school didn't pick up you know kind of uh, took off the ground well, because we lost him, and also it was right after the 2008 austerity, you know, the uh, austerity measures, the financial crisis. So we had the idea of reviving it, giving it a, a kind of a more larger uh, scope. And 
we are starting this year uh, a different kind of structure, not only lectures which would be interesting for academics, but uh, also roundtables every evening, which will be free and, and which will be streamed online uh, for all the participants. We start uh, with a keynote lecture by Denis Candioti at, uh, on gender and feminism in the Middle East at CCCB. Then uh, we have an event with EMED uh, on security, sustainability, uh, and energy issues. Another one on cities with CIDOP. And finally, with Diplocat on uh, para diplomacy, you know, uh, the diplomacy of uh, nations without states. So please do visit the eBay or Blancana websites. Do apply. Uh, we've tried to keep, you know, uh, um, uh, expenditures to a minimum. So I hope to see you in July there. Uh, but that brings me to today's talk. Um, and I mean, even looking at the title, uh, nationalism, Islam, and democracy. And these are all different courses that you can teach for a full year, actually. Um, and, and to put them together in like 30, 40 minutes, with the, within the, and then also focusing on, on a couple of case studies, it was a challenge, I have to admit, because it, I, I didn't think of nationalism and Islam. I've lectured about it, and, and I can kind of, you know, do it quite relatively easily. But when you put the third variable into the picture, democracy, then things get much more complicated, not to mention the issue of looking at different case studies. So I decided to actually start from the third one, uh, the question of democracy, uh, and, and, and try to see how the other two uh, variables, or these you know, this huge forces, nationalism and Islam, play into this. Finishing off with a little bit of uh, focusing on Turkey, not to leave everything like at, a, at an abstract and theoretical level, but to, to show you how things are playing out in a real case, basically. So uh, the question that I will address basically, why are there no democracies in the Middle East and the Mediterranean? We can reformulate this, why are there no Arab democracies or Muslim majority countries, you know, because the definitions do matter in this, in this context. Uh, but the, the first thing to be said here actually is that democracy is in trouble in the whole world, uh, globally. Um, you can see here, uh, we, there are three indexes that we use quite uh, regularly to measure the state of democracy in the world. One of them is Freedom House, the other one is the uh, Economics, Economist Intelligence Unit's um, Democracy Index, and then there's varieties of democracy, VDEM, which actually has the most variables inside. Now, as you can see here, the picture is quite bleak. Uh, the purple is countries which are not free. Uh, according to Freedom House. Yellow is partly free and green is free. Now, the, as you can see here, the tag uh, and the, the quotations in the titles is because these are the themes that the reports themselves have tried to highlight stress. Um, and and this, this, this was the title, this was the theme chosen by uh, Freedom House, Democracy Under Siege. Because democracy has been declining globally for the 15th consecutive year. I mean, overall, it's going down and down and down uh, since the trend has began in 2006. Now, this is, of course, we may say this is just Freedom House. For permission, I'm just going to, I cannot take off my mask, but I think I can do this one. Um, let's, uh, but it's not different in others. I mean, as you can see, the title that the Economist Intelligence Unit chose is Democratic Recession. And uh, in one year, the overall trend, the index fell from 5.3 to 5.2. But this is actually what, what comes after is the most important one. The biggest, uh, I mean, the worst record of democracy, again, since it was measured in 2006. You can see here that only 6%, 6 percent, 6.4 percent of the population of the world live in full democracies. Um, the rest flow democracies, hybrid regimes, authoritarian regimes. I'm not going to go through these kind of different terminologies in detail. 
it's, it's pretty much obvious they have different terms for the same thing, but basically the, the difference is, is very simple. Full democracies, full autocracies, and everything in between. Um, then, uh, and final, uh, let's see. Yes. Um, WIDAM has completely dropped the word democracy from the title and started to talk about autocratization changing nature. Because according to this uh, index, which as I said is the most comprehensive one, uh, the level of democracy that we have in 2021 is down to 1989 levels. So the fall of Berlin Wall. Um, and with the increase of Close autocracies, they mean full autocracies from 25 to 30 countries. And the biggest change here, actually, it needs to be said, is India. Modi's India also slipping down uh, to auto autocratization. 26% of the world lives under autocrat autocratic regimes. That's why they decided, you know, they just got rid of the word democratic, decline, recession, and all of that, and named it as it should be named, you know, calling a spade a spade we live in an increasingly authoritarian world. Uh, and this last category is important because this will be also uh, uh, the cases, most of the cases of, well, the best examples of, of democracy in the Mediterranean and the Middle East, or MENA, if you will. Um, even the best cases like Israel, Tunisia, well, Tunisia is also slipping quite badly, but Turkey, uh, they are usually considered at, at best electoral autocracies or hybrid regimes, uh, but never democracies. And this is 44% of the whole world. Why did I start with all of this? It's because maybe actually, you know, uh, most of all, uh, to get rid of the first important myth that everything is too bad in only the Middle East and North Africa. It's not. That's, uh, yes, I mean, the situation of Middle East and North Africa is probably dismal, quite bleak, dark, but um, this is part of the larger picture in many ways. So we're not going to, you know, that's actually one of the theories that I will try to, or the myths that I will try to dismantle to get rid of, and that is that, you know, the Middle East and North Africa is, or the Islamic countries, Muslim majority countries, whatever you, you want to call them, is an exception. Now, you can see that this is the economic intelligence uh, unit. I mean, uh, out of 17 countries, uh, no, out of 20 countries, 17 are authoritarian regimes. And this is one more than uh, 2020. And this one country is Tunisia, actually. And you see here, the, you know, uh, in this one there's no Turkey, but you can see that there are only, uh, okay, Israel is flawed democracy, well obviously because of the Palestinian question. Tunisia now slipped back to uh, hybrid regime and Morocco, and the rest is fully authoritarian. So it's, it's, it, is, uh, it is a very, very kind of, you know, um, yes, maybe it is part of a l larger trend or a global trend, but still, it is, um, even within that kind of overall pessimistic kind of dark picture, it is a quite pitch dark one uh, in many ways. So let's see then uh, just as a kind of parenthesis before going uh, into the details of it towards the end of the lecture, the situation of Turkey. Now in 2004, Turkey was presented as a model to the rest of the Islamic world. Like the example, uh, the, the best example of the combination of Islam and democracy. And this lasted until 2010, 12. Erdogan himself was greeted as, uh, as the leader of the kind of uh, free uh, Arab world uh, when you know, he visited Egypt. Uh, I was spending some time in Lebanon at that, at that time, you know, and, and the only two things that any tax, you know, the, the proverbial taxi drivers knew were uh, Galatasaray, the football team, like Barcelona, and Erdogan. Uh, and I was asking them, okay, well, what do you know about him? And he said that they were saying that he stood against the military, like, you know, he's defending Islam and all of that. Well, 
a lot changed since then. As you can see, uh, in 2012, uh, Turkey uh, started to decline. Um, and starting from a point 5.7, 4.3, but basically that doesn't mean much. It means that Turkey, uh, forget about the numbers, slipped from uh, what was called uh, kind of electoral, demo like uh, electoral autocracy, no, Electro uh, competitive authoritarianism. So it was pretty much free. Um, right now it's considered in all indexes as not free, not even hybrid. It's fully authoritarian. Uh, and uh, you can see that uh, it is also counted among the five worst cases of autocratization in the last couple of years. Uh, Brazil, Hungary, India, Poland, Serbia, and Turkey. These are the worst, uh, basically. Uh, and right now they call it as electoral autocracy. The reason why um, we still have the element of electoral here is because elections, uh, even though they're not fair, free, or uh, um, do not give a level playing field, uh, in the words of Levitsky and Wei, uh, to political scientists, it is still possible to beat him uh, in in the ballot box, as I will just you know uh, give. I mean, the the the, re the most recent example is the 2019 municipal elections, mm -hmm. which he tried to cancel uh, and redo the count uh, twice, uh, but he still lost. Um, so that means that you know the country still has maybe a small window, but still has a window for change. Um, but as you can see, the situation in general is quite bad. So let's come to our main question. Why then are there no Arab democracies? Now, I've chosen this article because it's, it's quite, um, it's one of the best articles written on the subject. Larry Diamond is a political scientist in Stanford, and he is the founder of Journal of Democracy, which is considered to be you know, the landmark publication in the field. And he has this article from 2010. Now, the date is important. This is before the Arab Spring. Uh, and the title is very provocative, but he's not like this conservative kind of Huntington type of or Bernard Lewis type of Orientalists or anything. He actually uh, tries to offer some structural explanations. Uh, and he's taking quite an optimistic view uh, in terms of possibility of change. Um, but of course, it starts with the obvious question. I mean, we've seen it in, in I mean, in terms of all uh, existing democracy and freedom indexes that we have and we use. All these are all quantitative surveys. These are all, you know, computing crunching numbers. So they are as close to, you know, uh, empirical reality as possible. Obviously, there is no certainty in social sciences, but still. And you have seen it. I mean, there are no democracies, including Israel, in uh, what we call the Middle Eastern manner. Now, he's very, uh, I think that's, that's, that shows the quality uh, of, of the political scientist. He doesn't use Muslim majority. He uses the Arab democracies. Because, well, to begin with, well, as we'll, we will see before, it's, it cannot be about Islam, because Islam is not the only thing that exists in the Middle East. Islam is a much... Uh, actually, none of the first five biggest Muslim majority countries are in the Middle East. Um, but uh, as he rightly asks, um, uh, he says, okay, but why are there no you know, democracies in the Middle East then? I mean, what is it that makes it only, only Lebanon after the civil war of 1975 was democracy briefly? Uh, and that was just a flimsy kind of temporary fleeting experience. We don't. And he gets, you know, he goes through a couple of uh, theories. I will call them actually, like, just for the sake of, you know, uh, yeah, making this a little bit more kind of uh, l informal and, you know, uh, the butler did it. I call it the butler theories of, of democratization. Now, the butler, we're not, I'm not talking about Judith Butler here. I'm talking about the word butler. Uh, and I thought that it, it, it actually came from Agatha Christie, but it wasn't. I mean, the, the, the, the, the term actually is attributed to some. Mary Roberts Reinhardt, 
I didn't know of her, by the way, but she's very famous because she is considered to be the American Agatha Christie. Mm -hmm. uh, she died in 1958, and the term, the butler did it, comes from uh, a mystery novel, the detective novel she wrote in 1930, called The Door. It's apparently, from what I see from uh, the internet, it's a very crappy uh, detective novel, and it's very obvious that the butler is the killer, you know, until the end, and that's why, you know, they just did it. So, basically, we're using it as a, as a cliche, as a stereotypical, predictable result, okay? And that's why I call them, uh, let's see, yes, the butler theories of the Middle East. Now, uh, because it's not the butler, obviously, I mean, one of them is, of course, this uh, more generally what we may call essentialism. Essentialism is that one characteristic, in this case, obviously, we're talking about religion and Islam, but there are some others, obviously, that determines everything about, you know, and, and you know that we have this term, I mean, it looks like a very kind of uh, fancy academic jargon, but it's not. It's, it's very much used in debates around gender today. There are biological essentialists, or what, as what is called as like, versus, you know, uh, say, radical feminists. Uh, some talk about, you know, ethnic essentialism, like, okay, you know, uh, the Afghans are like that, the Syrians are like that, the Catalans are like that, you know, just one thing, stereotypes. The best example, obviously, as you can see, I mean, here, um, I'm, I'm sure pretty much who are here would know the clash of civilizations of Huntington, the major, uh, we had two scenarios in 1989. One was Huntington, the pessimist. We will have conflict. But rather than conflict between ideologies, we will have conflict between or among civilizations. And he defined civilizations in terms of only one criteria, religion. And I mean, the article is, is terrible. There's no need to go into it. Uh, because of the arbitrariness of the categories, the way he defines uh, religions, etc. Uh, but I mean, to begin with, uh, Islam, as I said, is not, I mean, the most mus Muslim majority countries, you have the first five here. Indonesia, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Nigeria. Now, you may say that these are not fully democratic countries either, but all of them, until recently, India, in fact, was a full democracy. I mean, up to Modi. Uh, Indonesia, Nigeria, they are all much better in terms of democracy than all the countries in the Middle East. So Larry Diamond is actually correct. He's using a much precise term, Arab countries. Now, obviously, this includes uh, others as well. But the point is, this is the main um, uh, Thing. I mean, like, you cannot, first of all, explain the Middle East in terms of Ormena, in terms of Islam, but, you know, in terms of any essential one characteristic. The other, of course, obvious uh, butler theory uh, is the Arabs, you know. Uh, and one of the best examples of that is, um, if, I mean, I come from the study of nationalism, and Eli Keduri is a big, big uh, towering figure there. But he was a Middle East expert, uh, and he was an imperialist too. <laughs> I, mean, it's the, I mean, he's the founder of the Middle Eastern Studies Journal with his wife Sylvia, uh, Sylvia Keduri. But uh, Eli Keduri was a, was an imperialist, and and that was his explanation of why there is no um, uh, there is no democracy in Muslim majority or Arab countries. They have been accustomed to autocracy and passive obedience. Typical uh, neocon stuff, but avant-garde neocon, maybe we should say, because you know the term neocon didn't exist back then. Uh, but okay, if not, it's not the religion, then it's culture, political culture. The Arabs basically obey. Well, we know now, at least, uh, in retrospect, that this is not the case because we had 2011. Irrespective of the consequences, of the Arab Spring or the revolutions? No, the Arabs are not accustomed to the autocracy and they're not always passively obedient. They've shown us, they've shown the whole world. In fact, even to Turkey, uh, which was in a much better uh, situation back then, that 
they don't want to accept everything. And okay, I mean, you know, yes, uh, in the end it failed, and there are various reasons for that, which is not the topic of today's uh, talk. But basically, it wasn't. Uh, I mean, we've seen that it's not uh, the Arab people are not passive, you know, subjects, unable to show any kind of agency, etc. And we've seen the same thing, but I was quite pessimistic, to be honest, about the country that I was born and raised in, Turkey. But we had our own kind of upheaval in 2013, the Gezi protests. Uh, and it wasn't like Occupy movement. It wasn't like, uh, it was more like the Indignados, the 15M, uh, Kinse, M, Kinse M. <laughs> uh, let me be, you know, try to be. Um, uh, and the thing is, you know, uh, according to official figures, 3.5 million people participated in the protests. Now that's huge. And this is from a country where there are very few but, uh, bottom-up protest movements. So, you know, people do not accept everything as they want, you know, it's like as, as it is imposed on them. So the first butler, it's not the butler. The other one is, um, uh, and of course, you know, this is something that Fred was used to say. I mean, you know, essentialism is, of course, it's, it's very much related to the second one. The Middle East is, is somehow, you know, a special place which is different than the other parts of the world. Uh, and that's why, and, and, and Fred actually had a mirror image of that. So it wasn't only the West Orientalist, let's use the, you know, the Saidian way of the Orientalist gaze. It wasn't the, or, you know, the Orientalist way of seeing the Middle East, but also, you know, with the same existed within this, the, these countries. I mean, uh, a lot of people have written about um, Said uh, and Fred himself had a, they were close friends with Edward Said, but then they had a few high profile clashes on TV and radio and they stopped talking to each other. Fred was really angry when he was angry. Um, and uh, and one of the main criticism is that you know actually Said himself never considered anything that was going on uh, in the Middle East. He wasn't using uh, uh, sources in Arabic or uh, in in Persian. Uh, apart from Arabic, it, which was his own you know maternal language, he didn't, he didn't you know uh, he wasn't even knowledgeable about the Middle East, which he himself admitted. Uh, so the, the reverse image of this exceptionalism is regional narcissism, like the, the people believing that they are special, and if it weren't for the West, if it weren't for the imperialists or the colonialists, we would be better off. It's actually, you know, the same uh, coin with two different sides. It's the same thing. Uh, Fred says, you know, the belief that the whole world spends all the time plotting and worrying about the Middle East. Now, I think Fred is a little bit pushing the point here because while to a certain extent the world is thinking about the Middle East quite a lot, um, but well, it's not only the Middle East as we are seeing today in Ukraine. Uh, I mean, it depends on the context, it depends on a lot of you know, various um, other geopolitical factors, etc. But yes, I mean, we cannot trace all the problems that exist in the Middle East to external intervention, to Western intervention. It does make things worse, but it doesn't create the problems as such. Um, so two butlers are gone, then who could be the killer? Let's see, there is another butler, I think, which is it's the usual thing, you know, it's the economy stupid thing. And that was, that was, you know, for students of political science, like, like myself, uh, in the 90s when I was studying in, in Istanbul, most of our professors were educated in the, in the United States, in Ivy League colleges and all. And, you know, the first thing we learned about was what was referred to as modernization theories. The, fo the famous American school, which dominated social sciences for like from the 60s to I don't know, I think at least the 80s, until the emergence of post-colonial studies. And one of them was very famous, of course. Well, it was adopted in different ways by a lot of political scientists. But Seymour Martin Lipset, very basic idea: the better the economy, the more prosperous a country, the more chances are there are for democracy. 
So let's just invest in them, let's give them money, let's make them prosperous, and democracy will follow. Now, today, of course, we are kind of, we can even make jokes about this simplistic uh, understanding of, of development and democratization. But this was really dominant for a lot, I mean, for quite some times. And it actually uh, gave, um, um, I mean, it, it gave a direction. Uh, it kind of, you know, had a huge impact on policymaking. I mean, this was the, at the root cause of American aid or Western aid in, or the investments in the region, etc. But, the, the, you know, in itself, this doesn't explain anything either. And, you know, you can see examples of this uh, in, in Larry Diamond's article. That's why I quite like it. I mean, Kuwait is as rich as Norway. I mean, we're talking about only per capita income at this point, not other uh, structural problems, which we will see, you know, a little bit below. Uh, Bahrain is on a par with uh, France, Saudi Arabia with Korea, Oman, uh, with Korea, Oman with Portugal, etc., etc. Now, the countries which are much poorer, Egypt, Jordan, Morocco, Syria, Yemen, they are uh, at the lower end, but they're not worse than India and Indonesia, which are much better in democratic, uh, you know, in democracy, in, in terms of democratization scores, uh, because it functions somehow. So then the more obvious, I mean, this is probably the, the, the, the last character in the plot which will leave until the end of the novel, and you will think, no, no, this is, this is the butler, you know, this is the killer, which is not economic wealth as such, but the structural economic problems, distribution of income, and human development. I mean, because if you look at the impact of economy there, then it's a different situation. Obviously, Kuwait as rich as Norway, but is Kuwait as economically kind of uh, welfare oriented um, in terms of equality of you know distribution of wealth redistribution is like Norway obviously not I mean and that's one of the main problem but there is an interesting picture there and I checked that I checked the recent figures this is from 2010 but I I did look at the human development indexes from recent years and human development indexes does not only include do not only include economy, but also education and health. And again, you see that the Arab oil states, in terms of distribution of income, education levels, and health care, are still as good as at least Portugal. Hungary today would not be a good example, but OK, I mean, until Orban it was. And Saudi Arabia, Bulgaria, and Panama. So it's not even that. I mean, you know, it's. It's weird that even in countries where distribution of income is bad, skewed, uh, and there's much inequality, still, you know, the Middle East is not an exception. I mean, there's something else. Um, so who is the butler? First, I have to push twice, because first it wakes up, and then... First of all, there's no one killer. There are, it's a group. There are two accomplices. The, one, the ones who gave the key to the killer. Um, and there are two of them. Now, this is specific to the Middle East pretty much because, okay, it exists in other countries too, but at least in this case, it doesn't make it, uh, uh, I mean, this factor does make a difference. Now, the oil, obviously. Now, that's pretty much the obvious accomplice, and we say that, oh, he's the killer, he's the killer. I, I use the gender he because, you know, I'm kind of very politically correct, so I cannot imagine the butler being a woman. So he is the killer. Well, I mean, at least he's an accomplice, because over 46% of the world's oil is in that region. Now, the, the problem is not only econ external interference, which is a really important thing. The second accomplice is geopolitics. But it's, it's what the oil does to a country. No accountability, because, well, I mean, they have the money and they can distribute it again. They don't need taxes. They don't need to collect taxes. And, and that's why we have theories of rentier states, etc. I'm sure Anna will know them much better than me. Um, then, of course, they can afford to have a huge state bureaucracy uh, with 
a very serious uh, security apparatus. And that's why we had the Mohabarat, you know, in Syria, or, you know, the same thing in other countries uh, of the Middle East. Uh, and because of all this all-powerful state, we don't have a decent civil society. It's either uh, satellites of the regime, or it's, uh, uh, as we've seen in, in several cases after the, the uh, Arab Spring, it's the Islamist groups who are the best organized in civil society, which are not themselves democratic. Uh, but again, it has nothing to do with Islam itself. It's just that it's a different. Now, again, the Middle East is not an exception. But, and this includes countries like Venezuela, etc., not any single of the 20 countries that, that drive their export earnings from gas and oil is a democracy. So basically, okay, Middle East is not an exception here, but the point is oil, when it comes, it corrupts somehow. We've seen the same example in Bolivia, uh, in, in Venezuela. Um, so there's this kind of, you know, there's someone inside the house who opened the door, okay, to the killer. And uh, the geopolitics, obviously, I mean, all these problems have been made much worse because of international state, I mean, the regime, the world, you know, the, the, the structure of the, uh, I mean, the importance of the Middle East as an area, I mean, like, of course, and this, the most important reason is the Arab-Israel conflict, obviously. So the interference is much higher. I mean, Syria is a mess because of Turkey, Iran, Russia, to a lesser extent, the West. Like, everybody is in, and Syria doesn't have oil, imagine, you know. And imagine if it did have oil. Uh, and would, would the West be so quick to intervene if ISIS did not break into Iraq? These are questions to be answered, but my answer would be no. Okay, but the killer is the state. Uh, the state and the authoritarian state structure. Now here, um, Larry Diamonds, uh, like Fred, he goes a little bit further. He says, okay, again, authoritarian structures, etc., are not only uh, a question of the Middle East, are not restricted to the Middle East, but the Middle Eastern uh, countries have taken it to a much higher level. I'm not so sure of that. Um, but at least, you know, uh, it is important in terms of understanding now, uh, I'm going to the other two uh, variables in the title, Islam and nationalism, uh, to understand these other two, one and two. And, and that's one, uh, my pretty much argument. I mean, the state is all important and is the killer because of a lot of things uh, that are related to nationalism. Uh, and that's why I will, you know, that's exactly precisely where I will uh, kind of dismiss Islam as an important factor. Not because it doesn't matter, but it's, it has a subordinate role. Uh, it's like, let's just say, the weapon uh, of assault, okay? It could be a gun, it could be a knife, but it's the intention and the killer who wields the weapon. And that is nationalism. And that, that is what makes the state so important. Um, I have, you know, well, as, a, as befits a Fred student, like I have a very modernist approach to that. I mean, nationalism is all about the past, the historical past. Today, I was like, just coincidentally, I was doing my nationalism class with the first year undergrad students. Blancana University, 18 year olds, born in 2003, you know, it makes you feel like a dinosaur, I can, I can admit. And, but it's always, I start with their definitions of nationalism, patriotism, and all of that. And you can see all these things that dif differ here. I mean, like for them, and I said, okay, what is the one thing that defines Catalan nationalism for you? I, I pretty much knew the answer, but I wanted to get a confirmation. And yeah, it was, the mo I mean, majority said language. And, it, you know, the, the minority said history, of course, of the, the background and all of that. But this is the thing about the past. I mean, the past for nationalism is simply a tool, an instrument of the state. 
it uses it, it shapes it according to, I've just seen the title of Anna's uh, a recent paper that she wrote or a talk she delivered in CEDOP in conversation with a colleague that, whose name I don't remember. You said the same thing about extremism. I mean, it's used instrumentally. Um, so without the state creating the nation, uh, nurturing it, reproducing it, there would be no nationalism. Actually, you know, in the, uh, uh, for Arab nationalism, this was one of the words, historian Ernest Town used the word uh, a nationalism without nationalists, because there were no Arab nationalists in the 19th century. It was created, um, to be honest, again, much like the rest of the world. So this is, again, uh, uh, a Middle East is not an exception here. And here we come to uh, the idea of, I mean, the, the, the, the, the crucial uh, kind of binary here, the, the, the secularism versus Islam thing. That's exactly why religion is not in itself the defining reason, the defining causal factor. Because there were times where Arab nationalism the whole, the general idea of Arab nation or Arab unity, brotherhood and sisterhood, but also state nationalisms like Egyptian nationalism, this and that. They went through different phases. There were secular phases. I mean, Nasser was not an Islamist. In fact, he was the opposite. You know, the same goes with the Ba'ath regimes in different Ba'ath regimes in Iraq, in Syria. So basically, you know, when it fit their purposes and their current interests, they were the best seculars. I mean, look at the Turkish army. I mean, uh, but because the only alternative that, that could exist in such a suffocating uh, authoritarian kind of environment uh, was Islam. You know, they were also, and it was the two traditions. I mean, you had Michel Aflac on the one hand, and you had Said al Qut on the other side. One was defining, uh, was basically seeing nationalism as a heresy, you know, oh my God, it's blasphemous. It's, it's Islam, we are Muslims. On the other side, you had Aflaq who said that, well, Islam is there to serve the nation. And the thing is, these are not poles, like opposing polar opposites. It's, it's like a pendulum, you know, it goes back and forth, and sometimes, unlike a pendulum, it stops in the middle. Um, oh, five minutes. This is going to be challenging. Basically, um, uh, and the final point I can pass a little bit more quickly, the issue of universalism versus particularism, it's, it's very much tied to the issue of secularism versus Islam. Um, so this nationalism basically explains the force of the state. The state is the one which kind of controls society, is the one uh, instrument, the major instrument of socialization, education, media, etc., etc., and through a skillful use of nationalism, which may or may not include religion, in this case Islam, is shaping politics. One, two. So what happened? Turkey is Erdogan. Uh, I say this Turkey is Erdogan because when Erdogan came to power in 2002, this is a famous picture in 2004. I may just pass like two or three minutes, but not more. Uh, this is the, the famous speech that George W. Bush gave in 2004. This is um, uh, like next to the Bosphorus in Orteköy. You know, it was carefully, you can see that. I mean, they made sure that you can see a mosque behind. Uh, and, well, I mean, you know, the drill, Turkey, uh, the, the, a bridge between the Asia and the East and the East, etc., etc., blah, blah, blah, blah, blah, you know, the usual thing. And I, I have a similar speech by Obama. I have, you know, you, you have all the American presidents coming at some point and giving the same speech, which always usually is a nightmare for Turks because, you know, the fact that an American president comes to Istanbul means that the already terrible traffic becomes a nightmare, like, because, you know, they block everything. Uh, so this was 2004, and up to 2011, the Arab Spring, Turkey was a model, well, presented as a model. I never bought this, but anyway. Oh, sorry. So what happened? Well, Turkey became Erdogan's. Uh, Turkey produced Erdogan, but then Erdogan produced a new Turkey. 
And it looked actually quite interesting. Oh, I had a pointer, I was told. Uh, this, see, this part, the control over the military, everybody was kind of happy. In 2010, we had a referendum in which quite a few of the liberals or left-wingers uh, did support uh, a yes vote, not because they believed in it would bring democratization as such, or that the AKP or Erdogan is inherently democratic, but it wasn't, you know, it, it, uh, it, we will, I mean, we, well, I was pretty much of the same view. I didn't vote in the referendum, and I didn't campaign for any of the yes or no votes. But the point is, I did, for instance, believe that the, some of the changes that he's bringing might open the way for democratization. Not himself. Other forces can sneak in. Maybe Geze was possible because of this. We don't know. But the point is, things went downhill after 2010 and very rapidly. Uh, I watched most of it uh, from, you know, I, I left Turkey in 2010 under no pressure. I mean, I wasn't, you know, uh, a, a target of the government or anything. It was a personal uh, journey. Um, but I saw it from, you know, from a distance and it was getting worse and worse. In 2013, I was back as much as possible to be part of this Gezi momentum in many ways, but things went really bad. I mean, uh, actually, in two, from 2013 onwards, I also became a target of the government uh, because, you know, I was writing, I, I was doing a little bit of activism. And things have culminated in an attempted coup in 2016. Nobody knows exactly what happened there. Um, but the point is, we, the only thing that I'm, I can say with some certainty from the sources internal to the government and experts that at least that day the government was aware that there was going to be a coup. That's pretty much uh, something that we know for sure. Now, who organized it, who took part in it are, are dark, but it was, the mo it was the golden moment, the golden opportunity for Erdogan to take things to a whole new level constitutional changes in 2017, the president becoming a Putin-like figure uh, on paper and in the next, in the last uh, seven, six years, actually also in reality. Um, look at some, some of the other figures, like in, in terms of World Freedom Index, uh, Turkey is 153 among 180 countries. 90% of the media is government-owned. Uh, the leader of the opposition party, the Kurdish uh, opposition party, which is the most progressive pretty much party around, has been in prison since 2016 without any charges. Another uh, f important case, Osman Kavala, since 2017 for spying and for inciting a revolution, single-handedly, like he's seen as, you know the guy, Soros' uh, right hand in Turkey. These two this, the names are singled out, well, Demirtas is very important, but Kavala too, because the European Court of Human Rights asked for their release. Like, and it gave a final decision, and Turkey is circumventing these decisions, which may eventually lead Turkey being ousted from the European Council. All the HDP mayors who were democratically elected in the Southeast are pretty much uh, replaced with appointed trustees, and after the coup d'etat, 4,200 judges and prosecutors have been purged, basically. Now, this is where we see that Islam is not the deciding factor. The, the, the, the, I mean, the corruption scandals that erupted in 2013 and 14, the, uh, according to the official narrative, the responsible for the coup attempt is, uh, is the Gulen movement, uh, another cleric currently living in Pennsylvania, another Muslim leader, basically. So another kind of Islamist. It's like Hezbollah versus, you know, uh, or the Sunnis in two different factions. So basically, religion does not make a difference when it comes to power competition, you know, the politics of clashes and this and that. Uh, I mean, the, the most important, the single most important clash that Erdogan had and the most important challenge to his power came from another Muslim nationalist group, the, the, the Gulen movement. He prevailed, fine, but the point is it wasn't about Islam. It was a different conception of Turkishness. Now, I'm going to finish with a very little clip 
This is something that happened four days ago. Uh, there are still some small sects which are anti-state, uh, anti-Erdogan, anti which exist in, uh, in Turkey, uh, and they are under heavy uh, repression. Um, and this is, uh, this is, I think, the most graphic representation that Islam is not the question. You will see that the state interfering with a heavily kind of, it's, it's, an, it's an alternative sect. It's, it's very, very Muslim. Uh, it's called the Kurtul, whatever. The, it's, it's a foundation by them. The police uh, heavily uh, intervened in their kind of headquarters. And you will see uh, the symbolic picture of a, a, a headscarf police officers, a woman uh, with a hijab, let's call it like in the Western parlance, another one. And that, you know, is, and, and there were MPs in the parliament who were saying that, was this why we fought? Like, did we fight against the military for our freedom to wear a, a hijab for this? Now, I have to say that the following is a little bit graphic not little bit, quite graphic, and so it's consider this as a trigger warning, and I will cut it short, but I think it's important to see this. And let's see. Furkan Vakfı destekçileri, 8 tutuklu üyesinin serbest bırakılması için e, yapmak istedikleri eylemde polisin sert müdahalesiyle karşılaştılar. Polis göstericileri coplayarak biber gazı ve plastik mermi sıktı. Etkisiz hale getirilen vakıf it, üyelerine so dahi işkence it. dakikalarca so sürdü. Alparslan Kuytulu'nun başında olduğu Furkan Vakfı'nın üyeleri tutuklu 8 gönüllüsü için Adana Seyhan'da bulunan Cevat Yurdakul Caddesi'nde eylem yapmak istedi. Aralarında Alparslan Kuytulu'nun da yer aldığı gruba polis müdahale etti. Eylemcileri coplayarak biber gazı ve plastik mermi sıkıldı. Basın açıklaması yapmak isteyen Kuytul'un bir marketin deposunda polis tarafından anı konulduğu da iddia edildi. Konuya ilişkin sosyal medya hesabından açıklama yapan Alpersan Kuytul, çıldırmış gibiler, canavarlaşmışlar ve vahşileşmişler. İnsan bu şekilde ancak bir düşmanına vurabilir. Adeta gözleri dönmüş gibiydi. Çevik kuvveti bize karşı bu kadar doldurabilmek için hakkımızda ne kadar iftira attılar acaba? Süleyman Soylu'nun olduğu ülkede fikir ve ifade hürriyeti kalmaz. Süleyman Soylu İçişleri Bakanı olduğu müddetçe AKP oy kaybetmeye devam eder ifadelerini kullandı. Görüntüler üzerine gelen tepkilerin ardından İçişleri Bakanı... Um, thank you, Umut, for for everything. Um, it's um, it's very interesting that you've uh, mentioned India quite a lot because yesterday I was talking about um, the democracy, the decline of democracy in India in a in a conference somewhere else, somewhere else. Yes, and um, I was discussing Wolfgang Merkel's categories and how um, everywhere what we're seeing is not a decline of electoral democracy, people go and vote, but the problem has to do with participation, with rights, mm -hmm. and, and with freedom of speech, and, and what um, an Indian writer called Ramachandra uh, Guha calls the software of democracy. So um, this, is, this is very related, and actually uh, India is a Hindu majority country, so the problem is not related with Islam. The problem is not always related to religion. The problem is um, related to the instrumentalization of exactly. identity. Mm -hmm. The instrumentalization, when, whenever there is uh, a majority that's religious, um, then they use religion. When the problem has to do with language, then it's language that's in instrumentalized. And the problem with identity is um, that once you get the genie out of the bottle, it's very diffi difficult to get it back because it divides societies. And that is one of the problems that we're seeing everywhere, everywhere, yeah, not I just mean, in the manner. Exactly, I mean, in t today's, I mean, like, you know, the, the little local conflicts that are happening about, you know, about the courses of Catalan in class or the, the how many, you know, course, hours of Spanish you will have. Here it's language, okay? I mean, mm. it could have been religion. Everything in is Poland used. is religion, yeah. in yeah. Hungary it's religion. So, yeah. mm. the same thing, the evangelicals in, in Brazil, Bolsonaro's Brazil, Yes. which are very close to the regime. Yeah. So it's the same story everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One thing is, of course, taken 
whatever works at that point, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I don't know if uh, you have questions, uh, you have comments. Um, go ahead, I'm sure you, you, you can think about something. Um, but I wanted to ask you, do you think, um, because I've, I've been thinking about this a lot as well, and I'm not sure, I'm talking about the, how popular is nowadays the politics of the strongman. Mm -hmm. It happens with Erdogan, it happened with Trump, it happened with Modi, it's happened everywhere. So um, is that uh, mm, uh, the sign of a different change of uh, international order, I mean normative? change of, of order, do you think uh, there's something like that going on uh, because of the, yeah. um, the U.S. maybe b withdrawing from the MENA region and, and other actors intervening and then pushing a different set of discourse opposite that of the U.S.? Well, I mean, you know, this is uh, actually this is why I said, you know, I haven't been um, talking about Turkey uh, and even uh, not nationalism recently because I mean for the last four or five years since I moved to Barcelona I've been working on a completely different topic uh, not unrelated obviously but it's it's quite different like I'm thinking about the left you know why why do we have these people I mean of course there are and, and I'm not even going to start with like the rise of far-right populism etc etc strongman and everything. There are structural reasons for that. I mean, the limits of neoliberalism, you yeah. know, the failure, economic inequalities rising, sure. etc., etc. So a lot of yeah. this. And then there is the issue of culture and identity and belonging with immigration, obviously, mm -hmm. because it has increased a lot since 2015. Yeah. Again, through because of Western intervention. Uh, but today, not Western intervention. I mean, we have more than 3.5 million, I think, Ukrainians. That was the last figure that I saw, who are, you know, and coming yeah. in droves every day. So yes, there are structural reasons. But I think one of the most important reasons why we have this is because we don't have alternatives. I mean, on the left or the center. The center has become yeah. either completely adopting at least the discourse or the rhetoric of the right, the strong man. I mean, like in Denmark, we have a social democratic government, which is very welfare-oriented, social distribution and all. But when they talk about immigration, they talk about like walks, hmm. literally. Hmm. Not the machismo part, yeah. but the, immigra the immigration, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you know, then this is a reality. I mean, don't think that this is an exaggeration of the media. In the border of Denmark, they are checking the wealth of people who are coming and taking their belongings, their jewelry, mm -hmm. up to their golden teeth. So, and this is a social democratic government. Merkel did the same, Macron is doing the same, mm -hmm. Macron, to, to, in order to win the elections against now, not more, one, but two far-right candidates, Marine Le Pen and Zemmour, is, you know, taking and adopting this discourse and using it skillfully, like Islamofascism yeah. mm -hmm. and all of that. And the left, what are we offering as an alternative? We are, you know, deluded in certain little identity debates. What are your pronouns? Uh, you know, uh, LGBT rights and this and this and this, which are really important issues, by the way. But the point is, what does this say to all these people who are voting for the strongman? I mean, do we have any, okay, forget about the, the little things that, the other things that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and the democratic socialists in USA, they are asking for one major thing before the midterm elections. Erase, get rid of the student loans in the United States. Okay, simple economic measure, which would probably win them the election. Otherwise, they're going to lose it. And they will lose it if, if it, they go on like this. And, and then in 2024, we will either have Trump back or someone more appealing than Trump. Because, you know, he can, he can be really. Um, so we're not, you know, there is no, I mean, Podemos, Syriza, there was a kind of left populist wave, but they couldn't face this, you know, this monster, this juggernaut that we call austerity. And, you know, and, I mean, Syriza came and held a referendum to decline austerity, and then he accepted a worse plan by AM, IMF than before. So we don't have any alternative, and these are little things that, these people are quite skillful in using. I mean, Hungary doesn't have, they have a couple of hundred 
Muslim immigrants. You, you know, they're all registered. But he's using anti-Islam rhetoric to be, you know, to come to power, to stay in power. Orban, Kaczynski, all of them. Mm -hmm. Because what do we counter them with? As no serious agenda, no political uh, options, alternatives, philosophical, academic debates about rights and, and symbols and cultural, whatever, little things, that, that's detached from the real world. And I think as long as we have a serious alternative to, yes, neoliberalism, etc., etc., but mm -hmm. I mean, who will be tackling this and mm -hmm. coming up with a better kind of, yeah. we don't have that. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have it even in this country. We don't have it anywhere. Yeah, it's a difficult task. No, no center left. I mean, you know, it's in any country. Pretty yes, much. even if, if uh, you're not thinking about categories themselves, uh, it's it's just an, an alternative to to what they present. That's so effective, dividing people. That's and, so easy. To and do. personality. Co I mean, the only uh, living uh, uh, like like the most strongest candidate uh, against Putin was Navalny. Same personality cult. He had money, he had the, the social media networks and all of that. Uh, I mean, you know, ev even it's, it, they're, they're trying to imitate the game played by the masters. And, and people always go for the real thing, mm -hmm. not for the copy. Mm -hmm. OK, um, do we have questions? Please. I, I, I think I could do without a mic. But yeah, um, I'm fine. I can but hear But it is streaming, oh. so we need oh, streaming, we need, um, yes. yeah. Well, it's it's it's very much part of the picture. I mean, because this this is this is explaining the force of nationalism in many ways. Because I mean, when the empire was disintegrating, uh, the Ottoman Empire, but the others too, uh, the, the main factor that was actually, uh, I mean, the, the empires imploded because of nationalist movements. In the case of the Ottoman Empire, the Balkans and the Arabs. Uh, in the case of Russia, you know, you had different uh, things. And the only way to counter that, now, and then it did work, uh, because it was the time of, you know, the age of nationalism. Uh, uh, I mean, Kemal Atatürk in the National Independence War had to go for an alternative uh, identity, which was, you know, a new definition of a nation and the state. So basic, but he was... I mean, despite, uh, I mean, all the Tur Turkish, I mean, so I'm not saying anything original here. I, like, acknowledge my debt to a tradition of scholars. Uh, it's, it's, you know, from outside, the external view is that, oh, Atatürk was very anti-Islam and all of, no, no, no, no. He was using it very skillfully to mobilize the Kurds during the uh, independence war. He was very much, uh, he wanted to control religion for his own purposes with the Directorate of Religious Affairs. And the relationship between the state after him and uh, Islam was, again, a mar marriage of convenience. Sometimes very important factor, sometimes in the foreground. And it, could, it was not completely be able to be eradicated because, you know, we've seen that with the multi transition to multi-party, we had a much more conservative and Islamist definition of it. The same thing goes in, in pretty much everywhere. I mean, the state building uh, 
is the starting point or the root cause of the problems that we are having today, strong state uh, tradition in many ways. Now, the thing that makes me, and I don't have an answer here, think more um, like still a question mark here, to what extent the thing we call political culture uh, it makes a difference. Uh, because yes, the state uh, and historically and institutionally it can be explained through various mechanisms, disintegration of empires and all of that. But what about the state? I mean, obviously we're not going back to essentialism here. Political culture is constructed, it's, you know, it changes, evolves. But what is it that, you know, there is a, and it's not only in the Middle East, obviously, what is it that makes people to, you know, uh, to want a strong man or a strong state? Now, this is a question that I'm trying to, uh, because, you know, if you look at other surveys with people, you will see that, like, I've done the first uh, nationalism survey in Turkey, like, proper acad like, uh, academic survey, in 2006. And I found the result, the, the results that I had was pretty much the same that everybody else found. When you ask, how do you identify yourself, the majority of Turks definitely say, first as a Muslim, then as a Turk, and uh, there's a huge you know, group which also defined as Sunni Turk or Sunni Muslim Turk. So it's an identity, it's, it's an amalgam, it's a combination which still exists. And well, I mean, the, the, the reason why I brought in political society is, uh, the political culture is because of the question about civil society. Because in all the, with little brief uh, periods, the civil society that we see in Turkey and in the rest of the Middle East, I mean, Hezbollah is not a civil society organization, but it filled in the, you know, the, the, the function of a civil society in certain parts during certain periods. Same with Hamas before coming to power. Why is the civil society itself also anti-democratic? Again, strongmen. You know, Fethullah Gülen. They call themselves the service movement. Their own title, their own self-appointed title is the service movement. A service movement which is based around the personality cult of one single preacher. Fethullah Gülen. Nasrallah. Hamas, you know, all of these, again, I mean, even the civil society that exists is not democratic. So what is it in this geography, moving geography, that doesn't produce a strong movement for democracy? This is a question that I do not have an answer to yet. Repression, state, etc., etc., yes, but in some countries, you know, people fight. Yes? I, was, um, I think you had a yeah, yeah. I, I have a Maybe one way of your phrasing this political culture. Sure, yeah. What, one way you're phrasing this political culture, I, as I think about Turkey and the evolution, those who come to power, regardless of whether they're with the previous rulers or not, mm -hmm. try to be the state and assume yes. power. I mean, we could say this for the Young Turks, we could mm -hmm. say this for Kemadis, we could say this for the Democrat Party, we could say it for a whole lineage of parties. So what, is, what do you think, how does this political culture relate to the desire to take control of the state? Well, that's exactly the problem. I mean, you know, everybody is a Democrat when they're not in power, but the moment they're in power, they want to basically, first of all, yes, take control of the state, but also control the state as it is. Like all uh, opposition parties promise when they are in opposition that they will lower the election, the electoral threshold 10%, which is the highest in the whole world as far as I know, um, definitely in Europe. Uh, and then once they're in power, they like it because, you know, it eliminates all the opposition. I mean, it was set up for the Kurdish party, but, you know, in 2015, they organized, liberals also kind of, um, converge on this party and they pass the threshold. But today, uh, the only way it could work is the coalitions. So right now, for instance, the recent news, I'm not very hopeful, <laughs> to be honest, but I mean all the opposition parties, six of them, want to unite and agree on one single candidate 
which will run against Erdogan in 2023. Now, if they can agree on someone, that's one question. Whether this person will win is another question, because my hunch is that he will try to annul the elections or get rid of this candidate. But let's just say that the third option, the best option happened, and they won. Will they be uh, more democratic than Erdogan? Well, you can't get worse, maybe, in that sense, maybe. But the point is, these parties, the secular, so-called secular uh, Republican uh, Party, or the nationalists, the alternative nationalists, they don't want to sit in the t same table with the Kurds, for instance. So the six parties doesn't include, don't include the Kurds. What democracy are you talking about? We have here, by the you know the, the most, uh, the worst estimate of the Kurds. We're talking about 15 percent of the population. Some estimates go up to 20 percent. Then you have the Alevis, not Alevites, but the Alevis, the Turkish ones. Like, how can an opposition which doesn't include the Kurds? Uh, I mean, Selahattin Demirtas has been, you know, uh, the, his immunities were lifted with a vote of all parties in the parliament, apart from his own party. So, like, even the official opposition is anti-democratic or non-democratic. Civil society, today it doesn't exist. But when it existed, it was the same thing. And I've been, you know, involved in, in, in kind of different uh, kind of debates around, you know, feminism and all of these things, not, not willingly. <laughs> Uh, but the point is, you know, even the most progressive mind uh, is like, you know, it's just democracy and freedom for themselves, not for the others, however you define the other. So the concept of equality and freedom doesn't exist in the minds of these people. And I, I cannot fall back on essentialism. That would be a, a rejection of my own, like, philosophy of life. But, so there must be an explanation. Why is it like this? And I still don't have an answer for that. Yeah, it's always very difficult to find answers for certain questions, I'm afraid. And especially when it's something that's um, happening everywhere in so many places with so many uh, other manifestations. So um, if we don't have any, any further questions, yes? Uh, hi. Uh, uh, I couldn't help but notice one of the data points that you had mentioned in the graph that we are back to the level of uh, the level of democracy is back to 1989. So is there a connection the fact, the fact that post-89 it was the unipolar world led by United States which papered over the cracks which was already there. So in a way this hyper-globalization, the rise of one power was a blip our kind of now we are what we are living is in a blip in a history where it never existed and now as we see with the war in Iraq, war in Afghanistan, economic downturn and I mean the way US is receding from the global affairs, the rest of the world is coming back to what exactly it was. Well I don't think it you know that would be a correct kind of because you know the fact that it is back to 1989 isn't a good thing. In 1989 it was really bad during the Cold War because of the rivalry. It's, it was the hopes that have been raised after 1989 that, you know, we thought, oh, you know, I mean, Fukuyama version of it, the, the other version, the clash of the end of history. Now, everybody knew that that was pretty much, again, crap or rubbish. But, but the point is every, a lot of people in the U.S. also bought this, like, we won, you know, and then the rest will be democracies and everything. Like, for a while, it, it went well, but look at today. I mean, I mean it's, it's the, the lowest point you can get. I mean, an, a, a European country, well, whatever, however you define it. Like, you have China, which is almost as strong as in the United States in all respects, even maybe militarily. Russia is, is literally, uh, you know, maybe, well, not maybe, committing war crimes. Uh, and, and, you know, there's nothing that would counter this fact. And obviously, you know, all these little islands that were democratic in the past, I mean, how did Erdogan, for instance, 
was able to uh, he, he uh, managed to to to be so powerful using the refugee card i mean uh, the european union putting all these kind of oh you have to do this and this and this to be a member of the european union and then syrian refugees and Merkel goes immediately to Istanbul, sits in this kind of golden big uh, chair just before the most crucial elections in recent history, giving full support to Erdogan. Why? Because Erdogan say, if you're not coming, I'll put the refugees in the boats and, and buses and I'll send them to Europe. So, so basically the whole world order is broken. It's not only the US. The US is, is a lost cause, I think, <laughs> you know, in many ways. But what is the, you know, the European Union did not exist literally until like a couple of weeks ago. Now there is some, you know, they're like a, a child trying to kind of walk, uh, but still, you know, crawling. Uh, you know, it's not only the U.S.'s fault. And actually, why are we expecting everything that, you know, from, to come from there? Like India was a democracy. I mean... What happened with Modi is not too different from what happened in Turkey. Uh, so, and, and Modi is giving you know, f happy pictures and photo ops with not only Putin, but all the Western leaders. So. Of why it is the fault of US, but it was the rise of US and the fallback, which kind of covered the, what was already there, the fissures. So yeah. it's not the fault of the in U.S., it's sense, the fact yeah. that the U.S. is out of the global picture the way it was in the past 20 years, that we see what it was already there now. Yes. I mean, it, it, it was like the disintegration of the Soviet Union, you know? Every, every crack was already there, and there was a roof which was holding it together, or Yugoslavia. And once the, the, the roof falls, then, you know, everything falls back to... Now, what was the roof? It wasn't the United States. It was the Cold War, you know? Nobody could take a move. Uh, without endangering the existing stability, order, etc. Now, once that was gone, everybody was left to their own devices. Uh, so, apparently, nothing democratic did exist before either, as you say. Okay, do we have any more questions? I'm afraid uh, we are are going to finish with a, a quite negative uh, uh, feeling that uh, oh, okay. the world is... But anyway, I'm talking about India and talking about Modi. Um, if, if you remember, there's been uh, these uh, farmers' protests that have been going on for more than a year. And uh, due to the elections in two different um, states of India, Modi backtracked and repeal the laws the farmers were protesting against. So I think if, you know, if civil society, if people protest against, against common issues, those grievances that unite everyone, um, these governments, as long as they are a democracy, uh, like India still, you know, although, although with its problems, but it's still a democracy, they can backtrack and then you can, you can make changes in, in the system. And remember those uh, up there in, in, in the government that they have to be accountable in, in, in a way. So, because I want to be optimistic and, yeah. and uh, I think it's, uh, it's always good to think that we can actually change things rather than, but while we think about this, I think you have a lot of food of, for thought uh, for this, uh, for tomorrow, Friday and the next weekend. So um, we, can, we can conclude here. And thank you very much, Umut, thank for you. thank your you. conference. And thank you, everyone, for, for coming uh, to listen. Thanks. Sí, sí, sí, sí, me sonaba mucho tu cara, digo, se